coming. I realize it's a long queue when we have such an amazing full event. So thank you so much for your patience today. Uh, I just wanted to say we're really excited as Waterstones Cambridge to be working in collaboration with the Cambridge Union. So thank you all so much for coming. And we should be celebrating our fantastic author, Tim Marshall, interviewed by your very own Professor Brendan Sims. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Well, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure and an honor for me uh, to be asked to lead this uh, discussion uh, with Tim Marshall. Uh, he is, of course, a household name. Uh, many of you will have uh, seen him as a diplomatic correspondent on ITN. Uh, he's reported from all over the world from more than uh, 40 countries. But more particularly, for the purposes of this evening, um, he is, of course, a very well-known author on geopolitics. Um, with uh, now three uh, really major uh, books uh, which um, have hit the headlines and indeed uh, topped the charts, uh, Prisoners of Geography, uh, 10 maps that tell you everything you need to know about global politics, uh, then a book called Divided, which was about the phenomenon of walls uh, in geopolitics, uh, and then the, the, the uh, book before the current one, uh, The Power of Geography, uh, 10 maps uh, that revealed uh, the future of the world. But of course, uh, this evening, he's going to be talking about his new book, which is called The Future of Geography, uh, which is basically about the role of space and how that will change uh, global geopolitics. So the inevitable question is, having written the books I've just mentioned, what was it that drew you to space, particularly? Uh, realization of Orwell as always, was correct. Uh, Orwell said that uh, one of the hardest things is to see what's right in front of your nose. And it, when the moment that obvious realization that international relations, which I do write about, has moved to space, put the two things together and uh, write about them. And uh, as well as that, I've always been interested in space uh, as a child. I read Cosmos by Carl Sagan when I was in the early 20s. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it was a no-brainer. But do you conceive of space as something that is um, additive or substitutive in our understanding of international politics? In other words, mm -hmm. is this just another dimension that we have to take into account, or does it somehow fundamentally change everything? It's the former. Mm -hmm. Just as when you add on um, the Air Force to uh, international relations and, and air travel, mm -hmm. you know, you're just building on the platform that had gone mm -hmm. before. It's the same. In the short term, if you're looking at the military aspect, um, space is what the military people call the force multiplier. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also, um, it, it's used by the three ground forces. It's not in and of itself an actor. Mm -hmm. um, it enhances mm -hmm. their capabilities. Uh, on the commercial side, that's pretty exploratory. The economic model is uncertain. Mm -hmm. But um, th th no major company that is capable is going to miss out on what could be the new oil. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was one of the, for me at least, one of the real revelations of your book was the extent to which non-state actors are actually pretty major players in this story. Can you flesh that, that out a little bit for us? Yeah. Um, what sort of phenomena are we dealing with? It is different to the last time. The last space race was, um, those of us, well, two of us are old enough to remember it, uh, 60s and 70s. It was primarily driven by ideology. It was primarily which state or system could prove it was superior, the Soviets or the Americans. And whichever one of them got to the moon first, um, that would be one of the deciding factors. I do have a slide I've prepared earlier. Um, they're not in any order, but I think this is the right one. I've got a clip from JFK, early 60s. He had a very famous um, speech, which was called the going to the moon speech, and, and he said, um, we choose to go to the moon, not because it's uh, easy, but because it's hard. And that's the one that everyone remembers, but I came across this in the research. It was a speech to Congress in 61. And listen to the second half of the clip and he, he actually lays out the reason that they're doing it and it is because in the early 60s there was the Soviet system, there was the American system, it was a bipolar world, clear division with an awful lot of people wondering 
which way road to take. Hopefully, this works. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. So that, that's it in a nutshell, which road they should take. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at some of the declassified reports that went into the White House uh, after Gagarin had been the first uh, human into space, which followed on from Sputnik, the first satellite. And some of America's allies were concerned. Hang on a minute, are we backing the wrong horse here? Mm. And they were, the, the, the embassies were sending in these reports that we need to show them you're not backing the wrong horse. And I was reminded of... Um, there's a parallel here with what's going on with Taiwan, which is not, as you'll know, just about Taiwan. If the Americans do not show they are willing to defend Taiwan mm -hmm. over and over again, and it will be quite challenging them for, mm. for them to keep doing this at times in the next few years, all of America's friends, including treaty allies like Japan and the Philippines, mm. will start to hedge their bets. Mm -hmm. um, Japan could go nuclear. The Philippines would absolutely hedge towards China, etc., etc., And the whole picture of the Western Pacific would look different. Mm. And it was a similar thing going on there in the early 60s, that he knew that if they didn't win that race, mm. people might begin to hedge. So, sorry, uh, to come back to your question, Brendan, sorry. That's less of a factor now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Chinese want to be top technological dogs, so do the Americans, and they'll go at it. But... It's, it's about three things. It's about the romantic side of us, our restless side of wanting to explore what is at the top of that mountain. And out we go. You know, we've gone as far as we can here, and we're going further. And, and I think that's an inevitability about the human spirit. The two other reasons are probably more important. The military aspect is absolutely crucial. You cannot fight a modern military war mm. without satellites mm. and increasingly with extra things that are going to be in space. And then there's the commercial aspect. For better and worse, there is the potentiality for free energy by using solar panels in space. That's a fair way off. We can already land on asteroids. Uh, the Japanese have developed technology to mine them. There are asteroids that have more rare earth minerals, which are worth more than the American economy, $34 trillion. And then you get to the moon, which is the prize. We're going back there, I say we as humanity, we're going back there in 2026. Americans have said they will land a man and a woman on the moon in 2026. And that's both about the exploration is using it as a lily pad to get to Mars, but it's also because in the regolith, the, the, the soil, the earth, there are vast amounts of rare earth metals. There is the lithium, which we need for the car batteries, um, silicon. I mean, you name it, it's there in large quantities, and there's water. The Indians found water in the South Pole, probably in the North Pole. And here's the last bit. From the water there, as well as getting hydrogen, which you can use for fuel, there's helium-3. Helium-3, uh, if we can crack nuclear fusion, which we've been trying to crack every decade for the last four decades, we're always just a few years away, but if we did, helium-3 can be used for free, well, cheap, nuclear energy, which is radiation-free. And the Chinese have said, we think there's enough there, if we can crack nuclear fusion, to power all of Earth's needs for 10,000 years. Mm. So can you afford not to be there? Mm. It's like being in 1910 and mm. thinking, well, we know oil is the future, but mm. we won't bother with it. Mm. And the Chinese are on record as saying, uh, some of the very senior people, if we don't go, mm. by the time we get there, there'll be nothing mm. left. That's, that's the main difference between then and now. Sorry, it's a very long answer. So the comparison with oil is, is fascinating, um, but I suppose if you were to look even further back, what you've described in terms of uh, space as, as a potential military asset with bases and other dimensions, uh, the minerals you mentioned, um, you didn't talk about settlement, but perhaps we might come to that at some point, but all of that reminds me very much actually of European colonisation of the new world, uh, in inverted commas. Do, I mean, is that a parallel that was well, sort of lacking in your book as well? It is and it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I hate it when people say that. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, yes and no. Um, it is in that, that I think it is akin to colonization, 
But in the event that the clangers don't exist, you're not actually colonizing the moon where people live. And some people, <laughs> some people are saying, oh, you shouldn't despoil the moon. Why not? <laughs> Just despoil it. I'd rather despoil that and mine there than despoil here. Mm -hmm. So it's not colonization mm -hmm. in that respect. Mm -hmm. Whereas I do think it's colonization in a way is I think there will be some sort of land grab. Um, I'm going to have to skip on a couple of slides. <laughs> Oops. Um, to the Artemis Accords. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this, this, this goes back to these two different ways. The Artemis Accords is an American drafted accord and everyone that's underneath them has signed it as a bilateral agreement with them and the UK is a, a member. It's the Artemis Accords that is that going back to the moon in 2026 and a moon base in the early 2030s and the mining rights. One of the articles in the Artemis Accords talks about um, safety zones. Once you've invested to get there, invested to find the stuff and invested the mineral, the mining equipment, you can declare a safety zone. That's a worrying phrase, I find. It's akin to um, a sphere of influence, shall we say. And there's no laws, because if somebody else lands and starts to dig up whatever you found, you can't really say, well, it says on the Artemis mm -hmm. Accords, because they're going to say, well, we didn't sign it. So that's a massive gap we have where technology is well ahead mm. of legality. So what the Americans and others, including us, are trying to do is write the rules of the road so that it is a norm mm. by the time, you know, they want to establish the norms. And so people that arrive afterwards, and there's a similarity here with the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. Not everybody has signed it. Mm. Turkey hasn't signed it. America hasn't signed it. But 160 nations have. And it is regarded as the rules of the road governing the seas. And that's because it has been established by a few nations and then grown and become the norm. And the Artemis Accords intend to do it that. Mm. Conversely, you have the Chinese with Russia as a very junior partner mm. who would like to do something similar and write their rules in space. Mm. We don't have laws, agreed laws about this. So it's a very interesting part of your book is your description of how this legal system is evolving and, and its patchiness uh, uh, is very clear from what you write. Um, and at the same time, you describe uh, the absence of law, competition, which is inevitable, yes. is, is pushing its way. Uh, military, well not military, but uh, paramilitary or quasi-military or potentially military confrontation, certainly political uh, disputes. And you, you describe many, many different actors, but of the major players, you single out the People's Republic of China, the United States, and the Russian Federation. Yeah. Why do you do that? Why do you see those as the main contenders? They are the three big space powers. Uh, and China has, pun intended, rocketed up into probably second place and trying to close in on the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, because they're the ones with, the, I mean, space is expensive. They're the ones with the money. I mean, mm -hmm. the Jap There's the, those are the big three, the top tier. And those are the ones with uh, the most advanced technology and the, the historical memory of space travel. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones who intend to build bases. The Russians and the Chinese have a similar time frame for a base on, on the moon. Um, second tier, UK, Japan, UAE, Israel, Germany, France, Italy. And then the third tier, places like Nigeria and South Africa and others. Because there's 180 nations in space now. Um, who have a presence, because satellites have got much smaller. Some of them are the size of a Rubik's Cube. So the entry level into space has come down enormously, especially with reusable rockets. Mm -hmm. um, so you have these three tiers, but a clear, clearly at the top of those big three. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, it mirrors the international relations on Earth, an American-led bloc uh, of mostly industrialised democratic countries and a Chinese with Russia as a junior partner bloc, which is inviting other authoritarian states, such mm. as Iran, to mm. join them mm. in their efforts to establish the rules of the road. So you say relatively little about the UK in this story, and I infer from that that that's primarily because the UK is, isn't or is not yet a major player. Is, is that, do you think that is the case, or what do you think the UK would need to do we are a to mount, to mount a, a more effective response? We're a second tier mm -hmm. space power, but 
I mean, you know, if we if we then graded the the second tier, we mm. would not be at the top of the second tier. That mm. would be France and Japan and others. Mm. But we are second tier because mm. we have a, a third biggest satellite system in the world, mm. and that's a relic of the empire. When we mm. ran away, I believe that's a military term. When we retreated from empire, mm. we were smart enough to leave a lot of concrete behind. This is one of the key ways to understand mm. international relations. Look at the concrete. Look at where you can take off. Look at where you can plant yourself. And we left a lot of concrete behind all over the world and then realised, oh, we need to talk to each other. And they couldn't. So the UK developed its own military satellite mm. system, mm. one of the very few there is in the world, and it, has, it covers more than half the world. So that made us a player, and our satellite industry is actually thriving. Mm. So we are a player in that respect. We have a space command based at RAF High Wycombe, Strike Command in Buckinghamshire. And I, I, I visited a couple of times, and um, they're very clear that, as we said earlier, they're a, a force multiplier, they are an enhancer. And they gave me a, an example of what they can do. They know when the satellites are above, looking down, they know where our special forces are. They can say, if I were you, I'd hide for the next two hours, or mm. that lot, about six miles over there. You know, they, they just enhance the capabilities mm -hmm. uh, of what we have. So. Yeah, we're one of only a handful of countries that have a space command. And is there a, a connection then between what's going on in space and, you know, terrestrial geopolitical contests? And so you mentioned these, um, uh, these British assets and the infrastructure. Uh, some people say that uh, when the PRC is pushing into South China Sea or is looking for a, a bigger role in the Arctic, that at least part of that is also for satellite launches. Is, is, is that a possibility, or is that just imagined? The, 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 no, I, well, I think China has got <clears throat> its space bases already and is building mm. more. Um, as you probably know, you launch uh, west to east, because the Earth spins west to east, so you take advantage of the acceleration. And you launch as close to the equator as you can get. Florida uh, for the Americans, Kazakhstan for the uh, Russians and the Chinese are, are close to the, the sea, and we're in Cornwall. That's another story. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I don't think they need it f for that. The Arctic mm. is, is the, of interest, but more for the, the rare material. The, mm. Sorry, the energy mm. that, that that is there. Um, but you know that that is part of the geography mm. of when you're looking at uh, what's called astropolitics. Astropolitics starts on Earth. And you look at what you have and what you can and cannot do, and then continues upwards. Actually, I didn't know a lot of the things you mentioned just now until I read your book. And if I may say so, that's one of the great attractions of it, is that it's a, it it's a quick way to, to, to acquire that, that, that knowledge. And I wonder, could you share a bit more of it with us now? Because you, one of the things, and you, you touched on it uh, very slightly a few minutes ago, but one of the things that came across quite strongly in the book was the importance of space debris. Yeah. And to the uninitiated like myself, that seemed surprising. Yeah. But could you explain perhaps why that's, that's so critical? Yeah. I, I was on a learning curve as well in a lot of this. And one of the things that surprised me was that every single space expert I spoke to said space debris mm. almost as the number one issue. Mm. And I don't want to frighten you all, um, but be afraid. Um, the Kessler effect. If you've seen Gravity, the movie, there's a version of it. Kessler was a NASA scientist in the 60s who came up with this doomsday scenario where one satellite crashes into another satellite. And remember, these things are going at 300,000 miles an hour. They actually, it's like water. They pass through each other. So one crashes into another one, crashes into another one, crashes into another one, until every single satellite is just a million bits of metal. At that point in the Kessler syndrome, you can't launch any more satellites. Mm. And don't bother, don't bother ordering an Uber or your groceries because they won't arrive without the satellites. So it's a bit of a sort of nightmare scenario and we need to track this stuff. Now it hasn't happened and it probably won't happen. It's very big out there. But there's 8,000 working satellites. There's about 3,000 defunct satellites. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's one of the biggest issues that there is. The, um, I think I've, I've forgotten which slides I have because, they're, again, they're not in order. So, oh, yeah, let me come to them in... Let me come to that mm -hmm. and then on to space debris because it's related. Mm -hmm. Four countries, India, China, US... I was going to say USSR, <laughs> Russia and the, the United States have launched a ballistic missile from Earth 
at one of their own satellites in space and blown it out of the sky, for want of a better phrase. I mean, that's a bit sci-fi, launching a missile and blowing a satellite up. It's a bit either Dr. Noah, if you're of a certain age, or Austin Powers, if you're younger. But it's true, it's happened. The other thing, and that causes enormous amounts of debris, especially if you get it wrong. Now, obviously, they're only testing, knocking one of their own satellites to test that they can knock out an opponent's satellite, which is where war is destined to move to, as well as here. And then you get directed energy weapons, lasers. Um, the British are getting them in about two years' time. Americans already have them, the Russians already have them. The Russians, sorry, so, this is all coming back to space debris. Mm -hmm. Last year, when the Russians knocked out part of the U Ukrainian internet, Elon Musk's SpaceX flew in lots of dishes, satellite dishes. Dishy but flat faces, they call them, because they're flat. <laughs> they really do call them that. And he got the internet back up and running within two days in the Irpin region. And of course, the Ukrainian population were able to call each other and make sure everyone's all right, or try to organize an evacuation. And of course, the Ukrainian military used it for command and control to kill Russians. Why wouldn't they? Which does pose the question, does that make Elon Musk's Starlink system a uh, legitimate military target? We don't have laws, because the laws are in the last century, and this is 21st century technology. Anyway, the Russians dazzled, tried to dazzle. You can use lasers to dazzle satellites, um, but because it's so far away in the atmosphere, the, the beam isn't strong enough to actually knock them out. But on Earth, the Americans have already perfected um, using a laser shot to take down a drone at several hundred meters height. It's thought a kilometer is the furthest that the laser will fire. And that costs about $2 worth of electricity. Or you could hit it with a, a missile, which is what we do in Ukraine, and that's about $250,000 a missile. So what do you think is going to happen? Everyone's going for directed energy weapons, which brings me to that slide. If you have that technology down here, at what point will we take it mm. up there to protect our satellites, which, after all, are part of our nuclear early warning system? Mm. I think it's inevitable. The French are already talking about um, uh, bodyguard satellites. The Russians have already fired at something in space, but nobody's quite sure what it is. So that would create more space debris, um, which is a massive, massive problem, apparently, because this is our critical infrastructure we're talking about now. And I don't think people are really aware of it. You know, we know about water, gas, electricity, critical, the pipeline. We know that. Satellites are actually critical infrastructure. Mm. So I just think it's inevitable we would try and protect them at some point, defend them. Um, we don't have uh, legislation uh, to, to clean up space debris. The Japanese are doing a fantastic job in developing. They've actually got satellites with uh, robotic arms that reach out, grab defunct satellites, and mm. throw them into the atmosphere to burn them up, hopefully harmlessly. So we need a lot more of that, and we need a global agreement, which we don't have. So I was uh, pretty concerned when I read all of that in your book, and I hope the audience are also uh, suitably aghast, because uh, there's a lot that can go wrong. Now, can we put the focus uh, a little bit more precisely on a geopolitical aspect of space? which comes out very strongly in the book, which is the idea of choke points. Mm. Um, and how are we to imagine this? And what, what are the sort of straits of Gibraltar or, or of Malacca of, of space? Because you, you, you have fasc fascinating passages on that. Yeah, it's not an exact analogy, mm. but there, there, are, there is a geography to space. Mm -hmm. um, Everett Dolman, who uh, is a professor at the War College in the United States and is the sort of, I believe, the doyen of astropolitical thinkers, came up with this. I mean, international relations scholars and students will know about the Alfred McKinder's heartland theory. Mm -hmm. He who controls the heartland, etc. He's taken it up to space. Um, and if you control... Yes, who controls Earth can control mm. uh, near-Earth space. And if you do that, you can see everything. And if you're the only one there, nobody else can see anything. So you can move whatever you want. Nobody knows. If anybody else moves anything, you know. You really would... I mean... No one's going to, mm. but that's not the point. International relations doesn't work that way. Um, no one's going to control 
no one nation is going to control the Malacca Strait. Mm. But if any one nation tried to, that would spark a war. Mm. So that's the, the, the analogy. And the second analogy is part of this geography. Now, I would argue, and this is where it breaks down slightly, there are oceans of distance. Mm. I, I'm stretching it a bit there, but oceans of distance. Because we do measure geopolitics in how far it is from there to there and what I can do and how long it takes me to get there and assemble and all the rest of it. Same with space. There are super highways. You can slingshot around a planet, use its gravity, mm -hmm. so you leave less fuel. Um, you're welcome to the radiation belt. I don't want it. But I do want low Earth orbit because that's where most of the satellites are. Mm -hmm. um, and if I did control it, you wouldn't be able to get out. Geosynchronous orbit. There's only a certain amount of licenses that the uh, International Telecommunications Union uh, give out. And that's a really prime piece of real estate because geosynchronous orbit, you turn at the same speed the Earth turns. So consequently, your satellite is always over the same spot, which is incredibly useful. If you want to watch eyes on something 24-7, very, very useful. Limited amount of um, licenses and places to park. Uh, the, the moon, that does have a geography. Mountains, great plains, massive tunnels and caves, including caves that are 17 degrees as opposed to the boiling hot or freezing cold of the surface. The, the NASA call it T-shirt caves, um, where you could potentially build a base um, and very long tunnels, uh, which would protect you from the radiation. So I, I want those and you can't have them. I want to go to the South Pole, mm. you can have the rest of it. South Pole's where the water is, mm. etc. So there is this geography. And, I, I, and I, th I, would, I would say that one of the choke points would be near, near Earth or mm. orbit. You know, that, if, if one nation controls mm. that, one nation decides mm. who gets out. So I'm going to ask a few more things, and then I'm going to open up to audience questions. But um, I suppose that the really decisive issue is, you know, is there going to be a conflict in space? You, you've touched on it already sir, on several occasions. And there's sort of tension in your book, because on the one hand, you say uh, there is, um, you know, we need uh, co cooperation. On the other hand, you say, in a sense, competition is inevitable, yeah. and everything you've described points in that direction. So I suppose one might ask, given that that's the case, um, shouldn't that uh, uh, space race uh, be waged openly, and shouldn't it be won uh, by the West? Well, I'd much rather we went up there as one. I mean, I've always argued that the upside of intergalactic warfare is that we would all unite as the human race against them, whoever they were. But until that happens, you know, it's still us and them uh, here. We have great examples of cooperation in space. The ISS is, is one where we've worked with the Russians. The handshake in space between Apollo and Soyuz. Um, there are amazing medical research going on up there. There's a lot of good stuff. And there is, with the Artemis Accords, at least 23 countries that are coming together. However, you know the history of humanity, and it has been one mostly of competition. Mm -hmm. uh, the resources are potentially there. The economic modelling might work. That's to be mm -hmm. proven. So it is inevitable. The corporations will go. Um, there's a saying that the flag follows the trade. The East India Company is the greatest example. The East India Company went out there to rob everybody blind. They were so successful that the British state realised, we want some of that, and incorporated the private army of the British East India Company into the British state. The flag will follow the trade here. Japan is spending millions, uh, the Toyota, millions on uh, space buggies, sealed ones that you can live in for three or four days to roam around and explore. You know, they're not doing that for the benefit of mankind, humankind, sorry. They're doing it for the benefit of Toyota. Mm -hmm. That's one example. There are many. So it, it, it is inevitable there will be this competition. And given the tensions on Earth between China and America, it is inevitable. Mm -hmm. uh, another example. Remember I t we said about the ballistic missiles that have been fired and knocked out satellites? The Americans, having successfully tested this, have called for a moratorium on testing What's not to like? What's not to agree? Ah, well, the Russians and Chinese have parity with the Americans there. Mm -hmm. They can knock out satellites. They can knock out satellites. 
But the Russians and the Chinese know that the American satellites help to control the American military, which is much, much superior to the Chinese and Russian. So why would they give away mm. their ability, when they're not very good down here, to knock out the thing mm -hmm. which they have parity for? Mm -hmm. So they will not agree mm -hmm. to stop testing these. So it's incredibly hard to... to and I, I just, I'm pretty confident we will go through a period, as we did after the Second World War, and we had... Um, you know, the problems of the confrontation of the nuclear war. And then we learned to live with it, and we learned to have detente, and we learned to get the agreements, and SALT 1 and SALT 2 and all the others. I think we'll have to go through that period. On the plus side, MAD applies again. Again, those of us of a certain age remember mutually assured destruction. We grew up with a mushroom cloud over our shoulder. Um, it's kind of back. War in space could wreck the world economy. Mm. And so it's not in any one state's interest to start blowing up satellites, or other people's satellites, and get the retaliation, mm -hmm. because that would be mutually assured economic destruction. Mm -hmm. So MAD is crazy mm. and also logical and applies again. But you also, in your book, uh, look ahead to the possibility that that form of uh, restraint yeah. um, doesn't work, and you have a scenario Yes. Um, do, would you like to share just the broad, fun, the broad outline of that with us? Yeah, well, this, was, this was the fun... Yeah. Actually, I've got another fun thing, which I must squeeze in, because it's the best thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a bit of fun in the chapter called War. Um, you know, because war's fun. It's not. Um, where I have, I've got two scenarios. Um, the first based in the, in, in the, the Taiwan, Taiwan scenario in about five or six years, when... The Chinese have assembled the landing crafts, but not enough to take Taiwan, so the Americans are a bit confused. And the Air Force takes off, and the landing ships leave, and the Americans think, what the hell? And simultaneously, the Chinese take out a couple of American satellites, so they're blind, they don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Taiwanese Air Force and American Air Force are taken off for Taiwan. By the time the satellites come back on, all the landing ships have gone back home, and the Air Force has gone down to Kinmen Island, which is only two miles off the coast of which is a Taiwanese island, but only two miles off the Chinese mainland, and they've taken it. Mm -hmm. And are we going to fight for Kinmen Island? Not a chance. Fight for mm -hmm. Taiwan? Maybe. We're mm -hmm. keeping it, the options open. We're not fighting for Kinmen Island. Never heard of it. So this is that, that was my first scenario. Mm -hmm. And there's retaliation. Uh, retaliation is always calibrated. You have, to, you have to calibrate your response to something short of war, unless you mean to go to war. So the Americans calibrate by knocking out a couple of base stations and a couple of satellites, which is diplomatic speak for quit. But that's how they work at this level, unfortunately. I'm not sure there's any other way. Scenario two is even more fun. Bases on the moon, mining equipment, Russians come into land, Japanese block the landing strip of the space plane, which already exists, by the way. Americans had one that flew in space for two years without coming down. Um, and the Russians pull up and go away, and it's a diplomatic incident. And then two weeks later, they come back, and this time they don't pull up. They smash through, there's death, blah, 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 and that sparks a mini shooting match. And then the Chinese calm everyone down, and it's all fine. But I just, you know, it's kind of fun doing those scenarios. I mean, they may never happen. You know, that, that was like the 2030s. Yeah. I, I don't really look that far ahead, because you're just making it up as you go along at that point. So my, my final question is one that might be in the, in the minds of budding authors uh, in the audience, certainly was in my mind as, uh, as an author, which is um, how do you do it in the sense that you've written uh, a number of really, really successful books, uh, but that are all you know, critically acclaimed and also best-selling. So how do you decide on a topic? How, how do you work out this is going to, to appeal and, and then operationalise it? Well, I think it has to appeal to you, the writer, because mm. otherwise, what's the point? Um, I researched a couple of books ago, I thought, a book about gold. I was saying to uh, one of the students earlier, I honestly think most things are interesting. I did say those little plastic things that are around the top of um, plastic water bottles that you have to take off before you... They're not interesting, OK? I accept there are some things that are not interesting. But most things are interesting. I honestly think you could write a very, very interesting book about how... Heinz baked beans are made, and I, honestly, I believe that. So, most things are interesting. It's just how you put it across. So, you have to be interested. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you're supposed to write about what you know, what you've experienced, and your emotions about that. There's that. There's the great Hemingway quote, the secret to writing, ass to seat, fingers to keyboard. I'm a great believer in that. Get it down and then play with it. I mean, if you just sit there going, you'll never have anything. Um, and also, don't be too up yourself. Um, luckily, uh, you are not one of those professorial academics that chooses to use 17 words when 10 will do and ones of seven syllables when three syllables will do. But they, there's a lot of it about which I'm not sure what the point is if you're writing what you hope is an accessible book. So write in, in a clear, accessible manner, shortish sentences. You can mix them up. Um, Subclauses, one at the most, I would mm -hmm. say, in any sentence. Not three. Mm -hmm. No, three, you have to go, what was it? Mm -hmm. So put all that together. But the thing you have to have more than anything, I hope, is, is passion. Mm -hmm. And also an eye for stuff. I was desperately thinking of a way to wield my way back to what I really want to show. Mm -hmm. um, my, one of my favourite, oh, facts from the book. Um, I, I wrote a book about flags. I mean, it's not about flags, it's about identity and nationalism, but it's called Worth Dying For. And just to basically why a country's flag is what it is and what emotional <laughs> buttons that press. And it was full of what I call, oh, moments. Mm. And I think books that have, oh, moments are easy to read, and easy reading is hard writing, I'm told. So hopefully there's a few of those here, and this is one of them. Does anyone here who hasn't read the book know why the Americans go 10, 9, 8, 7? Are you getting, I mean, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> Six, five, does anyone know? Fritz Lang is the answer, the, the German filmmaker. So Werner von Braun, who made the V2 bombs that bombed the UK and was a Nazi and got his workforce from some of the concentration camps. The Americans nabbed him in 1945 and then about 100 other scientists and took them all back to the America. And then they whitewashed their past and he ended up on the Disney Channel, you know the story. The Russians got the second, second team, the B team. The French got the third, the C team. Von Braun, when he was a young scientist in Berlin in the 20s, went to the cinema and saw Frau im Mond. Now, many of us will have seen Metropolis, mm. the, the, the famous black and white film. Another one, not quite, was Frau im Mond, Woman in the Moon. And to heighten the dramatic tension, Lang did this. Oops, he didn't do that. He did this. He didn't do that. He did, I'll tell you what he did. He did this. <laughs> And that is not, that's not the original music. That's not bad. <laughs> that's not bad for the 1920s, but the Russians, mm. to this day, mm. say, we're launching at half ten, mm. is it half ten? And they press a button. I, just, I love stories like that. Well, the book is indeed, as indeed are all of your books, uh, full of such O moments. <laughs> um, I've got many more questions, but um, I think you have as well. So I'm now going to open the floor to, uh, to you, the audience. Um, and I'll do my best to take as many from as many uh, corners of the room as possible. So who'd like to begin? Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Tim, first of all, thank you for coming to talk to us tonight. But more than that, thanks for the books. Endless source of quotations for referencing in essays. Thank you. Um, they're very much give a juxtaposition to the normal stuff that comes along and they're interesting to read um, and, and I, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot with this but I can read these books faster than you can write them <laughs> <laughs> this one tonight so um, what next gold mm. beans artificial intelligence quantum mm. What, what, mm. what's on the plate sorry I didn't yeah I didn't finish the gold story I don't think yeah I, I spent three months researching gold three months of my life I'll never get back and then, then I thought oh, I don't care so I, just, I just jumped it um, there is a good book to be written about gold. Um, I, I had one idea, and I don't think it'll fly enough, and I don't think I care enough, which is um, a guide to doing business in various countries. You know, how much of it is myth 
that in an Arab country you do not sit like this because you must not show the settle of your foot. It's unclean and rude. It, that is actually true, but mostly among the older population, the younger people don't care as much about it. So that'd be, you know, that'd be quite interesting. And if you're in Japan, you give your business card with two hands, you know, just stuff like that. And then I thought, oh, no. So until I wake up one morning and think, I'm going to write about that, which is exactly what I did with space, I won't write another book. Unless you've got some good ideas. Thanks. Next question. There was a... Ah, yes. Over there. Yeah. Go ahead. Hello. Hi, Hi. thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch on the title of the book, which is Future of Geography. I just think that's very interesting. Um, sort of, like, interrogate that a bit. Um, and, um, like, focus on the space race um, and this sort of future of geography is one that's related to um, space and consumption. Um, I just thought if you had anything to say on, um, like, why you didn't um, sort of touch on ideas of climate crisis and other sort of crises that happen on Earth, um, and if you had any views on how that fits in this dynamic um, with space and this idea of consumption, um, humanity's consumption of lots of different things contributes to these crises. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering if you had anything to say on that. I, I, I do touch on uh, climate change, but I, 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 would, I would agree perhaps I should have done more on it. But no, I, I do touch on it uh, uh, with the mining aspect of these are the rare earth metals that we need for much of the renewable energy, including the stuff that goes into the massive wind turbines. And I do hope and mention how um, the potential for fields of uh, solar panels redirect the sun's rays down to earth where you can put it straight into a grid. Because one of the mo problems at the moment is that we haven't yet invented the batteries that can store vast amounts. And so your solar panels are fine when the sun's shining. The moment they're not, the electricity just dribbles away. Um, if, but it, there is no night and day up there. And so it would be beaming down all the time. It can go straight out into a grid. A country like Somalia could be um, have free electricity, which I hope that humanity would uh, provide the developing countries with, I hope. Um, as for consumption, I would argue that since we came out of the caves, all we've ever tried to do is be more comfortable. I think that's the story of humanity, comfort. And um, that is why we've always gone for consumption, and we're still going for consumption. I'm not saying it's necessarily a good thing, and we will continue to go after consumption. And um, that's why our major corporations will go to the moon and try and make enormous profits. Um, and um, consume things. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying it is. More questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned the powers that you think get to the most. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I did, but uh, briefly. Okay, yeah, in passing. Um, did you all hear that? Um, yeah, I mentioned it in passing. It is mentioned in the book. There's a chapter called Fellow Travellers, and it, it gets two or three pages. Um, they are the ones that found the water on the moon, one of their probes. Um, they are a second, at best, no, they are, they are a second tier power. Um, they're the, one of the ones that launched a, a missile. Uh, one of their own satellites. They are very interested in space vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan and increasingly vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, I, I don't think they're going to be... Um, I don't think they can... I don't think they'll get parity. I don't think they'll become first tier. I think the big three will remain the big three with Russia slowly falling behind. I don't think India's going to... I don't think India's going to match them um, but yeah, the most, as you say, the most populous nation. And they are beginning to have a space history. I mean, increasingly, they're a very technological uh, nation. Um, and they, they view space um, quite 
a lot through the military lens vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan and China, mm. the two problems that they think they have, well, they do have. Um, it's, it's a contrast to the African countries who are not interested in that at all for various reasons, and they're using it for, um, to try and combat climate change. That's why they're in space, mm. for growing food, um, when planting seasons. Um, but no, India, India's a player. It's, it's a player like Japan, UAE, you know, they're all players, but I don't think it's going to reach tier one. Could be wrong. The back? Like a space war, would it be possible to arm satellites with nuclear bombs or biological weapons? It's a very good question, thank you. Uh, there's probably not going to be a space war, it's the first thing, probably. Um, theoretically, you could, yeah. The Americans exploded a nuclear bomb in space in the, uh, either the late 50s or the early 60s. Um, which knocked out the very few satellites that there were. Um, yes, you can do it. You can put a nuclear... But it, there is actually a treaty which everyone has agreed. It's called the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, and it forbids any nation from putting weapons of mass destruction in space, which means nuclear weapons. So uh, everyone has agreed they won't do it. So it's not in any one country's interests to be the first to do it and break the law because then the other countries will do it. So I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think there's going to be a war, and I don't think they're going to put nuclear weapons on the satellites. So rest easy. Thank you. Gentleman at the front here. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier when you were talking about um, the role that uh, Elon Musk played in um, sort of restoring um, the uh, Ukrainian... Um, Satellites. I'm just wondering whether there are any, including I suppose Mr. Musk, but any other significant uh, either individuals or uh, non-national powers that have got an influence or will yeah. potentially have an influence yeah. in, in what happens going forward. I'm a bit like yourself of a certain age that you know, the Doctor Knows and the Moonrakers of this world are sort of fresh in my mind. It's come mind. true. <laughs> it's all come true. Star Trek. Can it come true, is it? Well, those weird things that you flip open and talk to people. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? That'll never happen. Um, oh, I'm glad you mentioned Elon Musk because I just happen to have here... One's impressive. Bringing two back. Wow. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you think of him. It, just, it, it might cloud your understanding of what he's doing. He is a true revolutionary. Um, Bezos is a player. Um, uh, Blue Horizon, his company, is also involved in the Artemis mission for the moon. SpaceX, his company, is front and center amongst the commercial aspects. There's more than 100 Chinese startups, space companies, and one of them is going to be SpaceX. Well, you know, you don't know which one because they'll all knock each other out because it's capitalism with Chinese characteristics. Um, they are one of the most rapacious capitalist countries you'll get, China. Um, it's an interesting way of doing communism. Um, so, yeah, they're there. The Japanese, uh, both Toyota I mentioned, but there's something called uh, Space One, one uh, it'll come to me, no, it won't. There's another Japanese space company, the iSpace, thank you. iSpace is, is going great guns. Um, so there's lots and lots of small and big companies who are really getting involved. And some of the, the more names that we're more used to, like Boeing and Northrop, uh, they are also involved. And again, as we said earlier, this is one of the big differences between the 60s and 70s. The, the amount of commerce and private enterprise that is in there that is driving 
a lot of this. Musk intends to put another 20,000 20, satellites up within a decade. And that's because there's money in them there. Bills. Okay, so we're running out of time. I'm going to take a couple more questions, uh, one after the other, and then allow Tim to answer. Yes, the lady here on the front, please. Factors like an ageing population or population inversion might hold some developed countries back from accelerating their technological advancements. I'll just take them all together, if that's right, and then you can oh, answer them. Yes. Yeah. There were a couple at the back. Yeah. Thank you. Is this working? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering, like, we were kind of talking about how like, some major Sorry. players... Oh, right. Yeah, some major players are kind of setting the roadmap as to how, I guess, like, the norms of the people who arrive after them. Um, so to me, it kind of seems like it's some of these countries are imposing, like, a legal framework on land, which to me feels very colonial. So I just wanted to ask if there's any kind of way that we could maybe ethically or equitably achieve settling on somewhere like the moon. Uh, no. No. I mean, the Russians are amazing colonialists, have been for centuries. Um, they're not about to stop being colonialists now um, just because they're going to the moon. The Chinese, they colonized Tibet, they colonized Xinjiang province, they colonized Manchuria. They're not about to stop colonizing. The Americans, they've called it something different. No, it's all going to carry on. Um, the developing countries don't have a, an aging population issue. Um, sorry? Oh, the developed, sorry, yeah. Oh, uh, only insofar as if it affects the economies, which, which it will. I mean, China, China has a huge demographic problem. Japan, possibly one of the worst. Uh, America doesn't. America doesn't have a, that aging population issue. Uh, we, we do. Um, no, I, 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 be, I don't think it will affect the space, um, the space race, no. We will still, um, if they have enough money, the, if you build it, they will go. Well, Tim, this has been a really interesting discussion, uh, very wide-ranging. It certainly opened up uh, a whole lot of perspectives into geopolitics, which certainly I hadn't seen until I read okay. uh, the book, uh, and certain things that weren't clear have now become... Uh, much, much uh, more evident to me listening to you here. So that was a very useful exercise. Thank but you. we must, unfortunately, end now, not before doing two things. First of all, to remind you all that if you don't already have your copy of The Future of Geography, you can purchase one and uh, Tim will sign it uh, outside on, on your way out. Um, and secondly, of course, uh, we'd like to thank, thank Tim you. Marshall very much indeed for a really interesting uh, conversation and uh, uh, certainly uh, giving us many insights. Uh, we're very grateful to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.